say, go out with somebody else and sample with them. Help, help them out. Okay? Because you'll learn something and you'll start to build that network. You can also ask them to help you if you need help. That's, that's a good thing. So it's the twist and turns. And so uh, I was, when you get your PhD, you have no idea in the world where you're going to be. And it so happened that I just moved up the road from uh, OSU up, up to Bowling Green and been happy there since. So, and I had the misfortune of being the chair of the department. <laughs> good, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so what I want to do today is <coughs> I wanted to just introduce a couple of the different projects that we're working on and the, and the graduate students that I'm working with. So one of the things that I'm most interested in doing is taking this says basic, using basic ecological principles to address, address applied questions in aquatic ecology. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of the basic biology and how it sort of drives my thinking. But I just want to let you know that I have uh, six graduate students right now. We're dealing with everything from spin-offs from my own dissertation work, looking at how turbidity, like we see here, Sandusky Bay, Maumee Bay, how the turbidity affects predator-prey interactions among species, uh, looking at how extensions of what Chris Winslow has been working on, looking at how round gobies and smallmouth bass interact in the presence of predators, looking at white crappie, their recruitment processes. I have a new student and she's driving me into the 21st century by wanting to look at how uh, using DNA tools to look at predation on larval fish. You'll, I'm sure you'll see larval fish here, have some good collections, they're little tiny pieces of protoplasm, and once they get into a predator's stomach, it doesn't take very long because you can't tell that they're even there. But using molecular tools, you can tell that they're there. And so, and so she's, she's been driving me forward trying to do that, and Megan's doing a great job. Uh, Rich is a uh, PhD student extending some of the trout work that I'll talk about today. And Jake uh, Miller from Iowa is really interested in looking at how the macrophytes that we have. So you get lots of macrophytes out here, okay? But there was a time when there weren't too many of them out here. And we're trying to look at how in Muddy Maumee Bay areas here, there are some macrophytes. How do fish use those macrophytes, the little fish, as refuges in a turbid environment, and I don't think they use them much at all, versus places where the water's clear? Because if you have visual predators, predators can't see you very well anyway, so I suspect that they're not using macrophytes very much. But we're looking into that, especially at a time when grass carp are coming in, when the invasive Asian, Asian carps to try to look at what effect they might have and get baseline data of the distribution of macrophytes in, in Maumee Bay. So that's what he's doing. And I'm not going to get into any of these. I was going to discuss some of their projects, but I always take too long when I'm talking, so let me not do that. What I just want to say is I'm always interested in ecological trade-offs. And the stuff that drove me when I was a graduate student and continues to drive me today is an example of that. Um, if you take the mortality rate of an organism in a certain habitat, and you look at it relative to the growth rate in that habitat, you can use those to compare the same ratio here, mortality rate to growth rate in other habitats. And it's been shown time and again that if you can quantify these, you can predict where fish should be. You guys can do this math really fast in your head. Make the growth rate the same in the two habitats. Therefore, they're irrelevant. Okay? If the mortality rate is very high here, okay, then this value will be relative to this one, then this will be smaller than this. The rule is choose the habitat that minimizes the mortality rate growth rate ratio. This stuff, this was generated back in the 1980s by some from fellows from Michigan State, and it has worked very well in some research that I've looked at, but it always brings me back not just to this relationship, but the fact that everything is a, is a set of trade-offs. Okay? We, talk, we talk about this all the time when we're talking about, uh, well, it was Jeanette who talked about it with her snapping turtles over dinner. You know, we talk about PCBs and all their negative effects, but there's a positive effect. So which is it, positive or negative? And so you, you have to be looking always at the trade-offs that occur among different uh, attributes or uh, environmental conditions. Okay, what I want to do today is I want to talk about steelhead trout. Okay, and I'll get into them. I just wanted to point it to it here. And we do some work that occurs in, with steelhead trout because there are species that get stocked into Lake, Lake Erie. And I'll give you some data here in the, in the next slide. So we start here looking at uh, chemical signatures, and I'm going to show you how we get chemical signatures from organisms to be able to track them. So first I want to talk today, and I just want to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, 
and that is I'm first going to talk about just stocking in, in Lake Erie. So they stock little fish in, in Lake Erie into the tributaries, okay? And then those fish go out into the lake and they grow like crazy there, okay? So that in a year, now they'll be this big. And in two years out in the lake, they'll be, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, that big, okay? <laughs> and so they keep getting bigger and bigger. Why is this important? It's important from a fisheries perspective because those fish then come back up into the tributaries where people can catch them. It's also important because they come back up into the tributaries in the late fall, winter, and spring, a time when people most often who like to go fishing aren't out fishing. So it provides a resource and a great economic value to the north coast of, of Ohio, Pennsylvania, and to uh, New York for the, the economies of that area. So that's why people, we, we've done that as a management agency in, in, in these states. But I want to look at it from a variety of other perspectives, some, some sort of ecological perspectives. So what I'm going to do is talk about the stocking in, the, uh, in Lake Erie. Then I want to show you the method that we use to tell where those fish came from. So they're stocked into different hatcheries, and we can figure out a method for determining who they are. And then I want to take you to looking at the adults when they come back out, after being out years in the lake and to look at some certain things about them. You've all seen the nature programs where they say, oh, the salmon... They reproduce and they have such great fidelity that they can come into their natal stream where they were born, okay, and they can come within a couple hundred meters of where they were born to reproduce again. And they do it with incredible accuracy so that 95, 99, 98% of the trout that are salmon that they find up in these streams came from this stream. Not many strayers, okay? So I'm going to talk to you about uh, things that we know now in Lake Erie where we stock the fish in. We don't have much natural reproduction. So I'll talk about an example where we look within a single stream to look at fidelity of these fish in the stream, and then I'll look at it across many tributaries in, in Lake Erie. Okay? So let's go back up to the stocking idea so you get a picture of this. So why are we called fish squeezers? Well, fish squeezers because we find males and females when they're ready to reproduce, and we squeeze them. Okay? So that we remove the sperm, we remove the eggs, we mix them together, mix them together, and we then incubate them, and we raise these in hatcheries. We raise them in hatcheries for about a year until they get somewhere in the vicinity of 160 millimeters, 16 centimeters. Okay? And that's an important point, because it's about that size when they say they start to go what we call through smultification. Because of their ancestry, they typically would go from freshwater environments into marine environments. And we know that physiologically they have to change, and so that physiological process, even though in our system they're going from freshwater to freshwater, they still go through some physiological changes that they need to. And so it's at about this size when they do that, and they leave the river where they were either naturally reproduced or stocked, and then somehow, okay, gives you some ideas later, somehow they come back, okay? So there's stocking that occurs from hatcheries in Michigan, Ohio, not too far from here in Sandusky, three hatcheries in Pennsylvania, and then this one way over here on the east side of Lake Ontario. And so they truck these guys from here over to different river systems, and I'll show you those, this to four or five different rivers in here, all from Ohio, Pennsylvania with all of its 42 or 48 miles of shoreline, stocks a whole bunch of them. In fact, they stock about 50% of all the 2 million yearling fish that are stocked every year in, in these rivers. So um, two, 1 million fish get stocked into these, this area right here. Ohio stocks about a half a million, New York about uh, 250,000, and Michigan about 50,000 of these fish. Okay? One of the things we don't know is when they go out in the rip lake, where do they go? Okay? And that's an interesting question. I don't have the money to be able to explore that yet. So if you want to give me, you know, what is it, crowdsourcing or whatever, you know, we have to have around here, you know, and see if we get some money. Um, so this is, this is what happens. They get stocked, okay? And questions that we might want to ask are, do they show release site fidelity? So if we release them in this tributary here in Ohio, a couple years later, will they come back to that same tributary? Or we might ask the question, how much do they stray? Do they go someplace else? Okay. So this, uh, this will lead to, uh, we have questions here, and I'll show you how we actually get to address this. Okay, so 
So now what I want to do is I want to take these hatchery fish and I want to say, can I determine something about them that gives me a unique characteristic for those fish? And what I'm going to talk to you about is otolith chemistry. Who doesn't know what an otolith is? Please, somebody raise their hand. Thank you. Okay. Uh, an, an otolith is a set of bones that base the brain of fish, and there are actually six of them. And so these will grow just like trees do. So this looks like a cross-section of a tree, doesn't it? You have all these rings in here, and we use them typically to age fish. They're very good measures of aging. If the fish is young, you don't have to. The scales seem to show up pretty well, but once they get older, they, you get some reabsorption on the scales, and so it's better to use the otoliths. And the Ohio DNR just uses otoliths now for most, most of their species. Okay? But what we can do is we can get, when this little fish was just a little guy, there was, the otolith was only this big. And then it grew a little more, and the otolith got bigger and bigger and bigger until we caught it as an adult way out here. Okay? Or we released it into a stream, and it's got an otolith that's this size. Okay? Just like a tree does, okay, but unlike any other bone in your body, the information on the water chemistry that this fish was in when it was little is embedded in this material here. And if you put it into a different water mass with the different levels of certain elements, and those are primarily strontium and barium, they'll pick up a little bit more of that strontium and barium and deposit it in that region. So we can actually look at the pattern of strontium and barium in their otoliths and come up with a fingerprint that will tell us which hatchery they came from. So we take a laser and we run a laser from the core here all the way out to the edge of these hatchery fish. And here's a, that's about the size of the laser beam right there on this otolith. And we can determine what we call a time-resolved information about the chemistry of the otolith. So it may have been that they were moved at some point in time right here, so you have one chemistry here, and then you have another chemistry that starts right here and continues out while they were staying in this other hatchery or other, other condition. Let me show you what that might look like. Okay. This is a uh, picture here uh, from the core out to the edge of this hatchery fish, these hatchery fish from Pennsylvania, from Michigan, New York, and Ohio. Pretty easy to tell a Pennsylvania fish, isn't it? Pretty, pretty obvious, okay? Not so easy necessarily to differentiate the New York fish from the Michigan fish or the Ohio fish using barium, okay? But there are certain areas where, in fact, you do see some differences. So I might be able to differentiate the Michigan from the Ohio fish by looking at the barium in this outer region of the otolith, okay, versus this one here. The New York one I might be able to differentiate because it's got a higher barium concentration at this point in time. So what we do is we take and we look at different regions. We've divided up the otolith into 20 increments or 5% increments, okay? And we've used the barium concentrations here, and this is just an example of five of them. We do the exact same thing with strontium. And then one of the things that I would strongly recommend to you all, because you all seem ecologically oriented, is to take statistics. Take as much statistics as you can. And a little, I, I think everybody in this room will say they may have Grown, matured by taking calculus, but very few of us are actually using calculus, okay? But I guarantee you, you take enough statistics and you'll be screaming at the TV every night because of people trying to sell stuff and not using appropriate statistics, okay? So we, uh, so we take this and we generate it into a multivariate analysis, and that's what this is here. You see I have an axis here. It takes all the strontium values at all 5% increments, all the barium values at the 5% increments, and puts them into a discriminant, it's called a discriminant function analysis. Not too important, but it's a, it's a way of meshing all these variables and saying, how can I differentiate these different uh, stocks of fish, these different hatchery fish? And so in this axis here, we have primarily strontium, and strontium is increasing on this axis. On this axis here, barium is going up here. Sure enough, one of the great things we have in Ohio is that the hatchery they have has incredibly high amounts of strontium in it, so high that it would be equivalent to the amount of strontium that they have in salt water. And salt water has a lot of strontium in it. So we can, we can tell, and I'll show you in just a second, every single Ohio fish with 100% certainty. Okay? The other species, the other hatcheries are a little more difficult, but they all have pretty much the same strontium levels, but they differentiate a little bit. 
with barium, okay, we've got the New York down here, the Michigan here, and the Ontario here. So we're pretty good at separating them. And in fact, if we look at it and we use certain other statistical techniques, we can say that, sure enough, we can tell the Ohio fish with 100% certainty, pretty good at these other hatcheries, good by this standard, but not quite as good trying to identify Michigan fish. So we are, we say we, we looked at all 182 fish that we were working with and we only misclassified seven of them. Not, not bad, okay? So we have this technique now to identify which hatchery a fish came from. Now, let's go out and take a look at the returning adults. So now the states come, they stock their fish, they go out, they spend a couple years out in the, in the lake, and then they come back and you ask, who are you, okay? So, one of the first questions we had was, we had some debate between Ohio and Pennsylvania biologists as to where they should be stocking their fish. Ohio guys like to stock them down near the mouth, okay? In Pennsylvania, the mouth is almost the only place you can stock them, the streams are so small, but they try to bring them upstream as far as they can. And there's a certain river system called the Conneaut, and I'll show you a picture of that, where we can test because both Ohio and Pennsylvania stock them into that tributary, but at different locations. And so we get to start to look at, well, who goes where in that stream? So we'll look, I'll show you that, and then I'll show you the stream across the lake, okay? So we take these adult otoliths here, and we run a laser through the core, out this way here, and take the information only from the hatchery region here. This is from when they were out in the lake. And although um, I think this is really important data, we haven't looked at this yet. But what we do is we know what hatchery this fish came from by looking in this region here. Okay? So just as an example, we have uh, a fish which will tell you are from Pennsylvania and Ohio. The Pennsylvania fish for barium ha has high barium, just like you saw on the previous slide and the Ohio fish has low barium levels. This is where they were stocked into Lake, Lake Erie, into the tributaries, okay? This might be some signature as into to which tributary they were put in, but we're not sure yet exactly. But you can see that once they get out into the lake, they have a common signature, okay? So now we can start asking questions about Ohio and Pennsylvania fish. We look at those different regions again, okay? The ones that we identified as important from looking at the hatchery fish. Okay. And what we're going to see is, here's the Conneaut Creek. The Ohio people stock theirs right down here at the mouth. The Pennsylvania guys stock theirs way up here, about 60 kilometers upstream. And the Ohio guys were saying, well, that's kind of stupid because of the fact that now they have to travel all the way down this creek here and there's going to be mortality that occurs. Okay. And so the Pennsylvania guys were wondering, so who comes back to my stream for, for my fishermen to fish for? And so we were trying to look at that to try to decide. So this is Chris Beeler. Chris was doing his master's research for this, and I wanted to acknowledge the Division of Wildlife because they certainly put a lot of effort into helping us collect these fish and do this work. I'm going to show you from the spring, we went out and we collected 49 fish in Ohio waters down near the mouth and 41 fish up in Pennsylvania. And we asked, who are you? Well, in Ohio, you might expect that it's about a 50-50 ratio between these two because they each stock the same number of fish. Okay? And so, sure enough, down at the mouth, we see that it's pretty much a 50-50 ratio. Okay? If you go up into Pennsylvania, you, only, you get no Ohio fish. You only get Pennsylvania fish. So if the Pennsylvania guys were allowed to bring theirs down to the mouth to increase survivorship of the ones that they stock, they would get no fish coming back up except a few strays from other places. <coughs> okay, so smart, smart to stock them where you're stocking them. We wanted to confirm this, so we went out in the fall and got the same thing, essentially. Okay, little difference here, but that's, I, I, can, I can explain that, but just from a biological perspective on what they, what they might be doing. So sure enough, no Ohio fish down here. Questions you might ask and they lead to other things, which you almost always find when you're doing research is you find more questions than you get answers, okay, is why are we getting New York fish in these streams? Okay, I'm going to leave that for right now because I have a, a bigger picture to talk about, okay? So now I want to go back and I want to look at straying across Lake Erie. We went to a whole bunch of tributaries from Michigan to 
New York and sampled the adults okay, in two different seasons. And we looked, these are the numbers that we collected, so not too many here, but good numbers in these other ones. And we wanted to ask, so where are you from? And I'm going to go from west to east on here. So this is the Huron River in Michigan. And I have them here right across Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Michigan, Ontario. We got some fish in there. There's some natural reproduction in New York, so we were able to look at those. And we have a small unknown pool. So what do you get out of this picture right here? ask other questions about, you know, these sorts of things, but let's leave that for right now, okay? So then we go to the next one. Dang, you know, go to an Ohio stream, they're from Ohio, okay? Even better than Michigan. Even <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, but Pennsylvania's a little better than oh, Ohio. <laughs> um, so if you go to the Pennsylvania stream, they're from Pennsylvania, primarily. Now let's go to New York, and we sample two streams in New York, okay? That's what I said. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's true too. And so the uh, New York fishermen, uh, f uh, DEC people were amazed at this. And you'll see that fishermen are also amazed because fishermen will tell you that they can tell you exactly where those fish came from just by looking at them. Okay? No. Okay? The interesting thing here is that you could say, uh, I'll explain this in the, in, in the conclusions here, but you could say, come on. There we go. That um, that there were so few fish in New York that in fact, yeah, these are just a few strays that went there, and they collected so few of get so few of them there. But in fact, from the fishing records, you catch as many fish in an hours of effort by fishing in these two streams as you do in any of these other streams. As a matter of fact, it's a little better even. So there are a lot of fish coming back up into the stream, and they're coming primarily from Ohio and Pennsylvania. And so you scratch your head and you try to figure out, well, what's going on here? And the answer is, I don't know yet, okay? But that is in proportion pretty much to the stocking. Pennsylvania stocks twice as many fish as Ohio. So well, that, that kind of fits. But it doesn't really tell us about the mechanism of what people are doing when they stock in Ohio or in Pennsylvania that might be different because we're getting the same proportions. Or maybe they're doing the same thing, okay? It's also uh, interesting to see that in fact, we get some fish that are stocked from New York, and we get some natural reproduction that's occurring in here, but not much. Okay? Not many fish are coming back from these systems. I'll tell you why that might be in just a second here. So, what are the differences due to, potentially? Well, there's information, there's, come on, there we go. Uh, size of the stocking. Okay. Remember I said, go back when I showed you the picture of that little small and I said it's six, uh, 160 millimeters or 16 centimeters in size. This is that little big. There we go. Okay. New York, remember where their hatchery is? It's way up at the foothills of the Adirondacks. Well, those hatchery guys say, we can't grow them that big, as big as we need them to. We want them to get up to 160, 180 millimeters. That's great. They can't get them there. Matter of fact, the average size when they stocked last year was 125 millimeters. So how big is 125 millimeters? Oh, it's like teaching in ecology class. Is it this big? Or is it this big? Or is it this big? Yeah, it's this one. Okay? So they're a little small. And we thought that maybe they're so small that they're staying in the streams. Now, the interesting ecological question comes up. If you're stocking so many fish into a New York stream and they're not leaving, then aren't you really loading this thing up beyond the carrying capacity of the stream? And they're staying there? So now the interesting ecological or community questions start to come out. What's the impact of that stocking on the organisms that live in that stream? Okay, so that's what we're doing next. We're trying to look at, look at that. Um, we think that they don't emigrate. Okay? We just did a study in Pennsylvania where they stock 46,000 of these fish, and, and Pennsylvania stocks them big. The average size is about 170, 180 millimeters in size. I keep getting too big all the time. I'm a fisherman. Okay? And we thought, two weeks and they'll be gone. They stocked them in early April. It was a little cold this spring. They stayed in the stream. They didn't leave at all. 
We had this high-tech equipment we were leaving out there to track them. Where the heck were they? Finally, the water temperature got up to about 10 C, and they started coming down. Only at night, they were coming downstream. You bet they were coming down at night because the bird predators were just everywhere to pick, to pick them off. The mergansers, some guys who were stocking put them into the stream down by the mouth. Within half an hour, there must have been 500 mergansers right there to pick them off. So, uh, so it was about 10 days ago when we went back out and we electrofished, we got density estimates from that stream. Okay? There were still 7,000 of these little trout in the stream. 10 weeks later, okay? so they're staying, they're a little smaller, which you'd expect, okay? but they were a lot of fish in that stream. So we think that competition within these streams might be a really important thing to look at. And that's, that's where, one of the directions we're going to next. Um, Okay, this, I just talked about the high numbers in New York, so I won't even address that here. Other questions that might be come up and that we're thinking, trying to understand this, is that uh, is, is stream distance important? How far upstream you stock them? Okay. Now, after what we did this spring, I'm not so sure. Okay. Uh, the displacement distance. When the ones from Ohio are stocked in Sandusky and they drive them 125 miles out to a streams in the east, east of Cleveland, does that screw with their heads? So we know that they have some sort of magnetic or ge geomagnetic abilities to figure out where they are, and then they use odor cues to, once they get near their stream to figure out if that's the stream they should go up to. But So by taking them 125 miles and driving them out and immediately dumping them into the stream, is, is that important? I used to think it was because I thought when they did it down at the mouth of the, of the river that within half an hour, half of them would be gone. Maybe that's why we're getting so much strength. No, I'm not so sure because of what we did this spring with the low temperatures. We stocked them in and they all stayed in the stream. So there's more, more to be done here. Okay. And the size of stocking. Uh, we're working with the New York guys to try to figure out what's the best strategy for them to use. Uh, I really want to thank Ohio Sea Grant for funding to look at this. We have uh, my colleague John Farber and I uh, have been working together for about a decade using otolith chemistries to ask a variety of questions. And this is, uh, was a great opportunity for us to, uh, to address this and to help the agencies in under, better understanding their, their management strategies that they're using. And we got, this was a great opportunity. I talked about collaboration. We got to work with all these guys from different agencies, and that has lingered. Okay, we were talking to the Pennsylvania guys. I've been out working with these guys in other projects afterwards. So all of a sudden, if there's like all these other people that we get to work with because we know them now. So... Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So uh, I think with your competition thing, one of the things that I know at least about the different streams, and uh, Dr. Beatty worked on a project, Cataraugus Creek is ultra oligotrophic. There's, uh, I think, a lot of the phosphorus indicate for tests that you were using like it was below but right at the mouth of it, right? Yeah, I think I don't know, yeah. yeah. So I mean that area has less food, mm -hmm. I would think. Mm -hmm. So if, are you guys looking at lower trophic levels then I guess So the the answer to cataragus is no. Okay? The answer to cataragus is if they give me money, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, in this stream where we sampled in, in Pennsylvania, it was just a little little stream. I mean, it's no wider than this, okay, at its mouth. But um, we did collect and keep some of those little trout from when we were sampling just a couple weeks ago, and they are skinnier, and they are they have food in their guts, mostly terrestrial insects, okay. which you might expect from little rainbow trout, okay. Um, so we want to go back now and look at who the species are that are most similar, sympatric with these guys, creek chubs, something like that, okay, and see how they're doing. Okay, we, ha we for have a fortunate situation where there's actually a culvert upstream at a certain right about where they stock. So we're going to go back and see have any of those fish gotten upstream, and it hopefully not, or at least at very low density. And so we can hopefully collect things like creek chubs. There's some darters in there, but I don't know how much overlap there would be with them, above and below, and see, see what we get as our first look at those. The, the problem with just field sampling versus experimentation is you could get a lot of contamination by fish coming downstream, 
and therefore, if you don't see a difference, it's not necessarily that there isn't competitive interact or resource limitations. Christopher? So I'm kind of curious with the stocking in the same stream. So Iowa is a mountain, Pennsylvania yeah. is 60 kilometers up. So I find it interesting that when you're coming back and looking at the adults, you have zero Ohio, but yet you have the other two states, yeah. New York. Yeah. So what's going on with those two guys? You know, Chris, it just it drives me crazy because we have two different seasons and we got the same results, right? And when we tried to publish this, we had some Yahoo telling us that we needed to collect more data. If they had any clue as to how much it took to get that, they, uh, they wouldn't be asking that question. But, but I mean, it's a good question. How consistent is this? But uh, uh, why are we getting some New York fish in there? You know, that, there are about as many, percentage-wise, there are about as many New York fish in that stream as there were in the New York streams. Right? I don't, you know, again, more, more questions than answers. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Um, no, so it takes these guys several years to get mature, okay? But um, I think I'm going to turn your question around, which is always a strategy when you're giving a talk, okay? <laughs> uh, there's a possibility that we got some fish coming down from Lake Huron, even a possibility that we got some fish from Lake Ontario who are coming up the Welland Canal. How many? Uh, I don't think that many, but it's possible, okay? Enough, so little, I think that the number of unknowns was probably too high for that to be a good explanation, okay? Hybridization would have, because we're looking at individuals that come from hatcheries, okay, we know that this fish came from a hatchery. An unknown fish would have to have been raised in a source that we didn't sample, right? So we were trying to be conservative and say, God, it, I, I could assign this to a hatchery, but I'm not confident enough that it really came from that hatchery. So we'll say it's an unknown. There was, there's some private stocking from people in Ontario. Could have been some from them. They don't stock very many, so I don't think it's them. Uh, so I, I have to put my hands up and say I'm not sure. I don't think it's hybridization, but because I don't think that's, that would, we would see that in our, in our ODA. Jeff, talk to us a little bit about imprinting, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, whoops, sorry. Oh, I'm glad it's you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, believe me. Um, tell me, a, I'm wondering if the New York fish, because they're stuck uh, smaller, yeah. haven't had enough time to imprint, and the Pennsylvania fish, because they're stuck bigger, are imprinted even better, and if there have has been any work maybe in, you know, dripping some chemical into a stream to provide a greater cue for, to encourage fish to come back to a particular area, in any yeah. of those. Well, areas. sure, you know, the, the early work that was used to determine that there is an olfaction is very important in, in their homing abilities <laughs> was work that was done out, actually, no, I don't think it was one of Roy's advisors, but it was out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Washington or Oregon, I can't remember where, where they did trick, tr drip an, or an organic into the water when they were raising these fish, and then they dripped it in a year or two later when they should be coming back, and they came back with great fidelity only to that spot. So we know that they use olfaction, probably of volatile organics, to determine where they should, should be. Okay? But I, I've, I've read enough about, uh, and, and about them to recognize that they've got to be using, and people have found some uh, magnetite in them, but not at very high concentrations, to how, how do you, you can't use olfaction when you're a thousand miles away out in the Pacific to get back in the region of where your stream is. So you have to be using some sort of geo-referencing. Okay? And so the idea and the stuff that I've read is that these guys do get back exactly how still a little bit up in the air, but they get within the region and then they cruise up and down the shoreline, basically coming up into some of the tributaries and sort of sampling, and then they can, when they, they're sure, but they've also shown them to be wrong sometimes, go up the stream, 
and continue and continue up. And they've shown that when they are branching, you know, you have two tributaries that uh, come together. They may go up the wrong one as much as 10, 15 kilometers, and they'll turn right around, come back, and then they'll go up the, the right one. So it's uh, a combination of uh, factors that allow them to get back. So you can look at that from a variety of perspectives. You can look at it from an evolutionary perspective. Why would they go back to their natal site anyway? Yeah. Well, no, you, you, you could have inbreeding, but you've got so many individuals. That's okay. usually not an issue. But from an evolution, from a survivorship perspective, why would you want to go and take, if you're in the Columbia River and you're trying to go that 500 miles or whatever it is to get all the way up to that spot where you were spawned, why would you make that effort? From an evolutionary perspective, it's because you might think, because you survived, that must be a good spot. So you, you could see how the uh, selection pressures for returning to those sites when there are so many options, okay, to go back to that spot is really evolutionary, so from a selection perspective, important to be able to do. Okay. So if you're like 15 kilometers up in Mitchell Street. Yes. And then for some reason you decide it's not the right one. And come back down and you go up yeah. the right one. I don't know. I feel like I don't know if they'd be able to determine what makes a better stream for breeding. Um, I, 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 I mean, I use the selection argument as to why that sort of strategy. You know, it's um, uh, Pacific salmon are semiparous. They go up. They only one time. They go upstream and then they die. Right. Atlantic salmon are iteroparous. They will go up their streams, reproduce go back out to the ocean, feed some more, come back up either the next year or the following year. Okay? So you might ask the question, well, from a logical perspective, why might you get these two extremely different life history strategies? And the answer would be, I'm not sure, but here's a logical explanation. It takes a hell of a lot to get up those streams in the Columbia River all that way, okay? And so making one trip and putting all your effort and taking all your internal organs and dissolving them so you can use that energy to get up there and then you're spent and you die and the nutrients from your body actually helps to feed in these oligotrophic streams your offspring through time. Whereas in the Atlantic streams where you're only, you know, it, you're going up these streams but it's not that difficult, these streams, but it's not that difficult, well then you have the energy to get back downstream, go out and do it again. Okay? So from an evolutionary perspective, that seems to make sense. And the idea of being uh, showing extreme uh, phylopatry to your natal site also makes sense, okay? And I can't come up with another explanation. But the wonderful thing about science is we're just waiting for somebody to come up with a better explanation and proving it. And then I'll back down, you know? But for right now, I can't see another one. Kevin, was there any questions online? No. No, no, we have maybe two. Or I think we have time for maybe one more. One more. Thinking in that same vein as the evolutionary perspective of it, um, since it's like when you compare R and K selected, they produce many eggs in the hopes that a certain percentage of them will survive to adulthood and make it. Mm -hmm. And usually, species like that are very selective of where they nest or where they put their eggs. They put because they don't put the effort into paternal care; they put it into nest selection. So maybe mm -hmm. selecting the perfect in the stream and going back to where they are, but maybe that's another way to look at it too. Okay. okay. Why they're going back to that same place. Good. Interesting. I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. Uh, do you know what R and K selection is? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, this is wonderful. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, we've got enough. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. <laughs>
Dr. Now. Beatty, Aquatic Ecosystem. Uh, Saturday we're going to be taking our large field trip. Uh, so everyone remember we're leaving uh, early, I think 7.45, 7.30. I forget exactly what I said or if I did say, but I'll make sure I get to you about that uh, again. But we're going to be uh, heading out to Sandusky Bay and out into the Sandusky Subbasin to look at the gradient of trophic conditions along the line. So you're going by both? My both, yeah. Okay, then from the docks now. Yeah. Yep. Okay, very good. Dr. Marshall, evolution? Pandemic means 17, 730. I'm going to get your breakfast and find you. I'm going to take you to the shelter. Finding safe. Oh, is this a mismatch day for you guys? Okay, that's all. That's the day I need to watch out. Yeah. 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 I'm going to walk yeah. down to breakfast. I'm going to catch you. Very good. Uh, Dr. Simon, uh, ichthyology. We have a quiz tomorrow, and then we're going to have some fun in the field. After we learn about the exciting world of sex. <laughs> okay, very, very good. Uh, Dr. Hogarth, uh, field zoo. Yeah, so we spent the day at Kelly's Island today, and uh, spent the morning uh, collecting fossils. It was a great day. Uh, we uh, had lunch, and while we were having lunch, I noticed that we had two tables of five students. Well, last year, we had a volleyball team named Team Death. <laughs> teams like a lot and show some things. Um, this year we have two teams, Team Death and Team Destruction. <laughs> so for all of you, we're going to be playing volleyball against this team. <laughs> then, we went, then we went to to uh, beach and collected the uh, antlion, tiger beetle, water paper. <laughs> 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 Lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> I think, I think it was actually Isaac who summed up the day the best. Uh, he turned to the class while we were swimming and said uh, something like, I do the same thing today on my 30th birthday that I was doing on my 10th. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
and, and go up and speak with Ken afterwards because, uh, you know, as you look around the endowment back there, a number of the people in the room, for instance, all the people on REUs, those are all financed by endowments from uh, Friends of Stone Lab, and people on scholarships, all financed from Friends of Stone Lab. And if you're uh, one of the students that we've hired, uh, some of that's also coming from the Friends of Stone Lab. So it's a real good support group. And very, very shortly after you graduate, you should all join the Friends of Stone Lab. <laughs> <laughs> and donate money again. Yeah, yeah. And donate money. And repay those scholarships. There you, <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. And uh, we also have a guest. Uh, Dr. Jeanette Schnars is here from uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant. She's the director of the research program at Pennsylvania Sea Grant and also the director of their research consortium. Jeanette, you want to say a few words about your consortium, what that is, what, what, what goes on there? And, and you guys actually, uh, you got to laugh, it's just like Stone Lab, right? Except exactly. for the IMAX theater. <laughs> <laughs> we have that too. So we're over in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, it's in the Comrades Environmental Center, which was built and opened up in May 2006. So it's a really new facility. Um, which is kind of, you know, polar opposite of Stone Lab, which has the classic, older style to it. Um, and we have several research labs. We do a lot of work with water quality and fisheries and just vegetation and invasive species. Um, and we also host a symposium in November. So I mentioned earlier, if anybody is interested in presenting, um, it's undergraduate, graduate uh, students that present their research, ongoing or finished research, it's a really good venue to um, present in front of other faculty members. Um, our consortium is made up of 40 different organizations, they include colleges, universities, state and federal agencies, other nonprofits like Pennsylvania Sea Grants is a member. Um, and it's just, you know, the symposium gives a time for all these people to get together that are involved in research in different ways to hear what people like you are doing in terms of research. So, um, not only students present, but also faculty members present. So, um, good way for people to collaborate and know what's going on in the region. And so, I'll definitely have an invitation. I'll send out the call for abstracts in August, and I'll send it to Ohio State Grant. So, that's definitely you can contact um, Jeff or Chris if you're interested. Um, about the end of August is when I start making the first call for abstracts. We have some neat collaborations. We're looking for opportunities for more, but uh, in, I want to say, July, we do our uh, press conference on July 10th uh, to announce the significance or the severity of the bloom forecast, the severity of the harmful algal bloom. And I believe the very next day, the Lake Guardian is in. Putin Bay okay. for two days with a bunch of teachers mm -hmm. on board, and that's a collaboration between Ohio Sea Grant, Pennsylvania Sea Grant, New York also, or just Ohio, Pennsylvania, and others. Uh, it's mm -hmm. collective, but it's led by you guys, I believe, right. on, on, on that one. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're excited. Well, mm -hmm. not, we, you can lead it every year. <laughs> 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 it's quite an effort. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, thanks very much for doing that. All right. Well, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce our uh, speaker. I think, you know, we had a fantastic research lecture. It's great to have uh, Dr. Miner come back. And, uh, and uh, uh, obviously, the tie with uh, Dr. Winslow, our associate director, and, and having his advisor come back. You know, my advisor's up here, Dr. Erdendorf. And there's a lot of uh, things that we've learned over the years from our uh, advisors. And, and Dr. Miner has also been up here teaching courses before, our fisheries courses and our introductory aquatic biology courses. So Jeff, great to have you come back. Always welcome back here. Uh, our speaker tonight for the guest lecture, a uh, good friend, person I've known now for probably about four years, I'm guessing. Uh, uh, Josh Knight is the executive director of Ohio Nature Conservancy. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about jo Josh's background, but I want Josh to also do the same thing that, uh, that Chris asked, asked Dr. Miner to do, and that's explain a little bit about how he made the decisions to do what he's doing right now, which you're going to see is considerably different from where he started. Uh, 
and and Josh, Josh, I like to think of as you know one of these real or Renaissance men. Yeah, he's an Ohio person. Uh, he sort of has a background at the two ends uh, with uh, Cincinnati and uh, Cleveland area. Uh, now living down in the, in the Columbus area where uh, Nature Conservancy is based. He's been the executive director for six years. For seven years, he worked in the Washington office, uh, really leading much of the business end of the Nature Conservancy. And I think he's got the perfect background for that. Because, you know, a lot of times we think of people in our uh, area let's say, as having a major environmental background, and, and, and yet that's not always the case. In Josh's case, he's got a BS and MA in International Relations from Johns Hopkins, uh, speaks uh, Mandarin Chinese, uh, worked for the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, led their Asian trade policy for a number of years, had lived in Singapore and Vietnam and Malaysia and Indonesia, and a, a, a real, real unusual background, but brings a tremendous uh, love and respect for the environment, uh, and has done some truly amazing things through the Nature Conservancy uh, by trying to uh, bring together diverse audiences in seeking uh, uh, some kind of common ground to move us forward on environmental issues. Uh, really uh, developed the financing through the Clean Ohio Fund uh, to get the 16,000 acre Vinton Furnace Forest Experiment Station purchase. Uh, currently look, working on uh, creating a bridge between forests in uh, southern Ohio uh, called the Edge of Appalachia, which a number of you have probably heard about, would, which would be the largest unprotected forest in Ohio. Putting all this together, so instead of having individual pieces of forest around, you have links between the forests. Uh, has been appointed to the, by the President of the Senate or Ohio to uh, the Great Lakes Advisory Board, by the Governor to the Ohio Recreation and Resources Commission, received the 2013 Green Leader Award from the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Council, uh, uh, Council uh, really led the way, I would say, among all the environmental organizations because Josh, with the way he works, is one of the few environmental organizations leaders that the, the business community is also comfortable speaking to. Uh, you know, and you don't very often find a person who represents, you know, the largest environmental organization in the state who also comes from a Chamber of Commerce background, so it's an unusual background but really led the way in the General Assembly to secure the $100 million Clean Ohio Fund, and that was a, a real, real big deal. Uh, and his work on policy issues, I think, is, is, is pretty incredible. Uh, so I'd like to have, ask Josh sort of explain about his background and how he went from, you know, Asian policy, Chamber of Commerce, Singapore, to Columbus, Ohio, uh, uh, Nature Conservancy. That's a, a, a little bit of an unusual step, but I think perfect fit for uh, for Josh. And uh, I'd ask Josh also to uh, explain a little bit about maybe jobs for students in the future or ways for students in the future to interact with non-governmental and non-academic environmental groups and organizations. So join me in welcoming Josh Knight. Yeah, thanks to you and, and to Stone Lab for having me up here. Um, so I am your speaker for tonight. Uh, you'll recognize that I'm wearing pants and none of the rest of you are. So that's uh, the dead giveaway here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a term that I've come up with called the green rule, uh, which really is my way as a non-scientific person of trying to talk a little bit about the importance of all of the work that you're doing 
uh, to society uh, at a much larger scale. Jeff asked me to start off by talking a little bit about my background. Um, and uh, for me, uh, this is my son, Will. Uh, he's actually right there with the Indian's hat, my wife, Laura, and uh, my daughter, Maya, right behind him. Um, family is a very important part of, um, of my commitment to the environment. I grew up with uh, two parents that were uh, into the outdoors. My father's uh, big into hunting and fishing. Uh, my mother's big into cross-country skiing and kayaking. And so I'm kind of the, the, uh, uh, the uh, offshoot of that. Um, my father is a pretty staunch uh, Republican. Uh, he knows the four seasons of the year. It's deer, turkey, quail, and I think something else will tell you. Uh, my mother's a college professor. She taught at University of Cincinnati for many, many years. Uh, had comes at environment from a very different uh, standpoint, but they both really appreciate it. So that's the genes and the DNA that I had growing up. Uh, I, uh, my background, as Jeff mentioned, is pretty far removed from the environment. And I think my background is a good indicator that you don't always get it right the first time. And I, I was listening uh, to uh, the group go around the REUs a little bit earlier. Uh, one gentleman here is uh, in interested in environmental science, but also history. And he said, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of tension there. Uh, one person uh, was in hospitality before she realized that was uh, something that she wanted to do. It took me a little bit longer to get to that. But what I wanted to say is that you know, along the way, I picked up a lot of skills that I'm able to use now in my current position. So I'm executive director of the Ohio program of the Nature Conservancy. I'm basically not qualified to do any other job in the Ohio program of the Nature Conservancy except be the executive director. And that's partly because I have a little bit of experience in a lot of different areas that I'm able to use in this, in this, in this job because I oversee, uh, as Jeff said, government relations. I oversee fundraising. I oversee the strategic planning that we do each year. I oversee a lot of our most important partnerships, including with Stone Lab and Sea Grant. And I work with the board of directors or trustees for our uh, program as well. And I should say that actually one of the best things I did about four years ago was to invite Jeff to join our board of trustees. And he served on that now. I think you're in your second term now. And that's been a tremendous asset for us. So for all of you, as you think about your experiences and you go through um, uh, your different kind of stages of your career, be sure to be cataloging what you're really good at. Are you a really good grant writer? Uh, do you do really well in terms of the experience side or the outreach side um, that uh, the lady back there uh, mentioned that she had some experience with? Um, think about those types of things because those are all what we call transferable skills. And you may decide somewhere along the line that you want to make a leap or you want to make a change. Um, you're able to do that. I came from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and went to an environmental organization. That's about going from the North Pole to the South Pole in many respects. But what I was able to do was to go to an environmental organization, which works a lot with the business community. And they were looking for someone that spoke the language of the corporate community had a commitment to the environment and was really excited about figuring out ways to leverage the power of the private sector for good conservation results. And so I got hired. And within three years, I was running our corporate uh, partnerships program uh, in our headquarters office. And I got a lot of great experience uh, at that point. And then when this job opened up and the opportunity to come back to my home state of Ohio came around, I left it the chance. It's a great opportunity especially for someone who's kind of ADD like I am, you get to do a little bit of a lot of different things in the course of the day. So it's a lot of fun. Um, for environmental groups, you know, it's like an ecosystem. Uh, there are groups like the Nature Conservancy, which I would argue are a little bit more um, moderate or uh, maybe even some would call conservative in some respects. Uh, maybe an EDF is like that as well. They work a lot with... Uh, the business community on different policy issues. What's, what's EDF? Oh, I'm sorry, Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and then you may find some other groups that are a little bit more activist. You just need to find the right fit for you in terms of uh, organizations. And I think that's really important when you think about different groups to go to work for, um, uh, if, if that's a decision that you decide to make. Um, one of the great things, though, that uh, a lot of environmental organizations have are internship programs. Uh, it's a great way to get exposure to that group, get your foot in the door, 
Um, and I mentioned with the REU uh, discussion that we had a little bit earlier how important it is to network. Never stop networking. Jeanette said it, I think, as well. Uh, those types of uh, relationships that you build throughout your career, uh, not only with the people that you work for, but all of your peers will serve you extremely well. You'll learn about opportunities, especially within different organizations that you might be interested in working for. So I'll stop there in terms of a little bit of my background. I'm happy to answer some questions afterwards in a little bit. So, all right, so I'm a generalist. So I will apologize in advance for this presentation because after watching Dr. Miner's presentation, I realized that I brought a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> <laughs> I have no graph <laughs> in this presentation. I have a lot of pretty pictures. Uh, and Jeff said, you know, be sure to tell people what you don't know. Well, we don't have that much time, Jeff. So <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But here's the cool thing about my job. I work with a lot of really smart, really cool people that are doing a lot of exciting work like you are, and I get the chance to experience a little bit of that every day. I get to go down and see what the folks are working on down in the Appalachian Forest and the work they're trying to do, connect up some big forest blocks. I get to hear some of the work that we're doing with farmers out in the western Lake Erie Basin, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. I get to see some of the bat uh, research that we're doing and bat modeling that our uh, GIS uh, folks are doing trying to predict and help the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service figure out where the best habitat is left in the state for Indiana bat and uh, a northern long-eared bat, uh, both of which have been hit by the, um, the white-nosed fungus, the, the latter in particular. Uh, so I get a chance to have a lot of that exposure. We have a saying at the Nature Conservancy, you come to the Nature Conservancy because of the mission, but you stay because of the people. And I think that's very true in a lot of groups that you'll, that you'll end up having an experience with. And I know that's true for, uh, for Stone Lab. All right, so you, you don't know what the green rule is. I, you shouldn't. I made it up. So uh, <laughs> if you do, you're lying. Uh, and, and Jeff, and this is, when I emailed Jeff what the title of my presentation would be, here is, this is from Jeff's email back to me. He said, I like it. However, one of the reasons I like it is that I will learn something. What is the green rule? So this just shows how well Jeff vets his speakers, because he has no idea about what I'm going to talk about here. <laughs> and, he, and he is one of our trustees, which, which is great, because I get a lot of latitude uh, in terms of the board. Um, but the green rule, I'll just give you a little bit of a preview, and then I'm going to tell a story to illustrate it. But the green rule is really something that I think all policymakers and decision makers need to understand. Uh, they need to understand how much we depend on the environment for our quality of life and our livelihood. But it also has something to teach all of us who already know that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in, in a little bit here. So let me dive in here. I'm going to talk about a, a story here. So uh, a lot of you are familiar with uh, uh, the Great Black Swamp, I, I would think. Uh, it's a uh, an area that uh, was once about 1,500 square miles. And to give you some perspective on that, that's the size of what the present day Everglades is. So that's how big of a, of a, of a wetlands we had up here in Northwest Ohio. Uh, settlers found it, uh, not surprisingly, unproductive. Uh, they saw it as a blight on the land. Uh, this is a quote, a direct quote from the history of Perrysburg uh, it called the Great Black Swamp an oozing mass of water, mud, snakes, wolves, wildcats, biting flies, and clouds of gnats and mosquitoes. So you can understand why so many people wanted to relocate out here to farm. Um, but in order to do that, they had to drain the Great Black Swamp. And that's exactly what, uh, what they started to do and do it very efficiently. Um, it is amazing what people were able to do at the turn of the last century, with the technology that they had available to them to basically drain this swamp. I mean, this is an engineering project, in some respects, on scale with something like a Panama Canal type of operation. They had to install miles and miles of ditches and do a lot of re-engineering of the streams up here in order to get the water away from enough land to make a productive farmland. And this exciting story is told at OSU's Drainage Hall of Fame. Now, show of hands, who has been to OSU's Drainage Hall of Fame? Thank you, one person, I love it. So, could you, sir, describe to me what the OSU Drainage Hall of Fame is like? Uh, it's basically about the size of this uh, screen here, and it has plaques of people that have helped in draining farmland, or draining poor farmland. 
Perfect, perfect. Okay, so it is a display in a larger building. That is the Hall of Fame. Now, this is important because TripAdvisor ranks the Ohio Drainage Hall, Hall of Fame as number 35 of 72 attractions in Columbus. <laughs> now this is just, uh, <laughs> this tells you a little bit about what there is to do and see in Columbus. This is why we're up here this weekend and not down in Columbus this weekend. Uh, not only that, it was clearly a life changing, did it change your life? No. Okay, well, <laughs> you apparently weren't one of the people that left one of the following comments on TripAdvisor. It was definitely a life-changing experience for this man. I never thought that my life would change because of drainage. <laughs> Words cannot explain. This is another, another uh, uh, quote. Words cannot explain. Someone told me to see this, and I thought it was a joke, but wow, was I wrong. The tale of these men has inspired me to learn even more about drainage. I even found out that the laser level was invented here. I do not understand why this is not higher on the list of things to do in Columbus. <laughs> And then finally, my favorite, free parking, free admission, not crowded. <laughs> no interactive displays for the little ones, but never a way to get in. For any drainage buff, which you clearly are, this is a must see. And then a little smiley face emoticon. So, all right, well, back to our story here. So, let's talk just a little bit about uh, what we were able to accomplish here. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, uh, but this is something that I've gotten to know over the last few years as we've gotten deeper into working with the um, agricultural sector. Um, we got very, very good over the years at moving water off the land, and we did it uh, because it, drainage is obviously very important to growing crops. You can't have your crops sitting in standing water because they will rot and they will not grow properly. So we put in what are called tiles, uh, tiles that used to be ceramic, but now they're these plastic uh, tubes. Uh, they have uh, large machines like this that go ahead and scrape a uh, trench. The, the uh, tile is laid in there, um, and then uh, it's covered up again. And there are perforations at a certain level within the tile, which allows the water that goes down to collect there. It's then moved off to a pipe that comes out into a ditch, usually at the edge of the field. Um, and those ditches then uh, often lead into uh, a stream or a river. So let's talk about those streams or rivers. All right, this is a smart group. I've established that already by your laughter about the Hall of Drainage story. Um, can anyone point something out about this map that looks a little unusual? There's a lot of straight streams. Very good, very good. So why doesn't nature make straight streams? I mean, that's a lot more efficient way to move water, right? And in fact, there's some even straight streams with right angles, right angles. which I love too. <laughs> I mean, that's a great idea for a stream. So this is the legacy of what we were able to do in terms of draining the Great Black Swamp in Northwest Ohio. We installed miles and miles of ditches to the point now that there are more man-made ditches, miles of man-made ditches in Northwest Ohio than there are natural streams. Uh, and of course, for all of us who have um, experience in this area, uh, what that ends up doing is the water moves very, very quickly off the field, very, very quickly into these drainage ditches, and very, very quickly ultimately into rivers like the Maumee and the Sandusky, and with them, they carry nutrients which a lot of you are studying the, the uh, impacts of, because when they end up making it to the lake, we end up with this. Um, so these are some very uh, startling photos uh, that are taken um, by, um, uh, I think, NASA. Are these NASA photos, Jeff? I think yeah. these, were, these were some that we've seen before that you shared. And I think this is a 2011 photo of the al uh, algal bloom uh, in Lake Erie. Um, and this has tremendous unintended consequences. So again, think about it. We're draining land because we want to make it more productive for crops. We all need food to grow, uh, and we use crops now for a lot of other different purposes. Um, so we went ahead and we re-engineered the way the water system works in Northwest Ohio. Um, and one of the impacts that we have as a result of that is 
uh, the harmful algal blooms because of the high nutrient levels in Lake Erie. Um, that then leads to impacts on all of us. And this is where the kind of the green rule comes around full circle, um, and that is that the more we um, the more we tinker with nature, uh, the more we change nature and don't fully appreciate what we're doing has an impact in terms of our quality of life, the more we end up with um, impacts that uh, actually have a very substantial um, uh, effect on our quality of life. So some of you, I think during the REU, someone mentioned uh, some of the beach advisories that we have up here. I mean, clearly that impacts our ability to enjoy uh, the 61 public beaches that we have along Lake Erie. Um, that has uh, economic implications as well for the people that live up here. This is actually not a shot from Lake Erie. I went up to visit uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's in 2011 when they had their um, algae outbreak there. They have a $150 million tourism industry uh, each year based on the lake. People don't go there just because they want to sleep in a plot or a tent in the middle of nowhere. They go there because there's a lake there. It's an amenity. Uh, that's what draws people to that area. Uh, there was someone saying that they're from Dayton and this is a place that they often go to visit. Well, that $150 million tourism industry does not very, fare very well when people can't only um, enjoys and swim in the lake, um, but they're even advised against um, taking their boats into the lake because the spray um, is also considered to be very toxic as well. Um, this has a much bigger impact, of course, for Lake Erie uh, when you're talking about a $10 billion uh, industry that relies on um, uh, tourism and recreation. And Abby, uh, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about um, charter boat captains, and you said your brother was one as well. Uh, Lake Erie has one of the largest charter boat captain fleets of any of the Great Lakes. Um, no surprise, because we have uh, the most fish of all the Great Lakes. And um, that industry has been impacted as well, so much so that, that uh, sometimes down at the State House during some of the meetings, I actually see some of the charter boat captains coming in to talk about some of these issues especially when it relates to um, uh, regulating the use of fertilizers in, in Northwest Ohio. I do think, though, that the scariest part of all of this uh, gets back to public health, uh, public health for all of us. And um, anyone know who uh, Henry Bigger is? Henry Bigger? So Henry Bigger is a hero to the people of, of Carroll Township. Um, Henry Bigger is the superintendent of the water treatment plant there. And uh, last September, uh, he went in and he actually was doing more testing than was needed for the water treatment plant to see wh what the levels were of microcystin, uh, which is the toxin that the microcystis, the blue-green algae, gives off. And what he found was uh, 3.5 plus parts per billion uh, microcystin in the water. And to give you a comparison, the World Health, Health Organization has put the safe level for ingestion at one part per billion. It doesn't sound like a lot. Well, it doesn't sound like a lot to me. A lot of you guys have chemistry backgrounds. You probably figure that it is a, quite a bit. But microcystin, in terms of its toxicity, is somewhere between DDT and dioxin. Uh, so this was a big deal. So he actually shut down the plant uh, for a number of days. They had to have... Uh, drinking water distributed until he could flush, flush the system out. So this is a real world example of where what's happening upstream is having a tremendous impact downstream. So that gets me to what I call the green rule, which is basically people, society at large, suffers when nature is treated poorly. And we talk a lot about that. We environmentalists, conservationists, biologists, ecologists, we talk a lot about that. And I do have to say that we need to talk about the next bullet point as much as we talk about and warning people what they're doing to the environment. We also have to talk about the upside, and I think that's something where the Nature Conservancy is a little bit different than a lot of other NGOs that are out there. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, when we talk about things, we don't shy from the ch away from the challenge or we don't shy away from the problem. 
but we also want to offer a solution. We also want to offer people hope. We want to be able to say to them that it is true that when we screw up the environment, things get harder for a lot of people. But it's equally true, and we've seen how well the environment can improve when, our, when we do treat nature well. So I actually go in, when I talk to business the business community, I say, you know what? I understand that you're not excited about regulation. I understand that you feel it's another burden to you to be able to provide jobs and be productive in terms of these different places. But let's talk about things like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Did they impose some, some burdens on business? Yeah, probably. Did uh, the economy completely collapse, as some pr predicted? No, it's actually stronger. Uh, did those two acts have a tremendous impact in terms of public health and the health of our environment? Absolutely. One of the big things that the shale gas drillers now talk about is that when they have the flowback water that comes out of the wells, they pump it into class two deep injection wells to dispose of it. Pennsylvania, they're having all sorts of problems. They don't have the geology to support it. It's much more karst. They can't put it uh, down deep into the ground. And in some cases, they were supposedly treating it, dumping it in the streams. You, you can't treat it to that level, especially the radon that you find in it. So in 1985, when those class two deep injection wells were first proposed, industry had said, oh, we, you know, you can't tell us what to do with this. We've got ways to dispose of this. Now, industry in Ohio, they point to that as one of the first uh, arguments that they make that they can actually safely dispose of flowback water. Now, there are some issues now that we're, we're starting to figure out in terms of when you pump too much down there, if you're close to a fault. Anyone from Youngstown, they've had some issues with seismic activity. So more research needs to be done on that. But the point being is that if you can show a connection and you're a business person between uh, your practices, the regulations that are out there, um, and the quality of life for people out there, you will have a license to operate in these different communities. People will say, yes, we will accept you in, we want you to provide the job, but we want you to do things the right way. So I try to turn that around and make the same argument with them when we're talking about different types of conservation or environmental regulation. We're, uh, I'll talk in a second about the, uh, the agricultural sector, but we're working with the Ohio Farm Bureau right now and a group of agribusinesses on trying to improve the way that farmers in Northwest Ohio are applying fertilizer to their fields. And they know that if they can't figure this out, they are probably going to get regulated. And in fact, there are some regulations that are starting to come online, and we've actually supported and pushed those along as well. Nature Conservancy has. But we're able to work with, we have a window to work with the, with the agricultural community because we're able to go to them and say, if you guys get this right, you guys will move out from being in the bullseye in terms of what's going on in Lake Erie, um, and someone else is going to end up taking the heat. But you got to commit, and you got to do it right. Um, so that's a little bit about some of the conversations that we're having, trying to bring different people in to, to be part of the solution to some of these problems. This final point here, and we talked a little bit about it during the REUs. Um, all of us in the environmental field need to do a better job thinking about integrating the needs of people into um, our strategies and goals. I think about, there was this newspaper article, what's the local paper that's up here in, in, in South Bass? Is there a little paper? That, the Gazette. That, the Gazette, the Gazette. So I brought my dad up here, we were going to go walleye fishing. It didn't work out, long story. But we're, so we're just sitting there at the butterfly garden and we're like looking through the paper uh, basically and he starts laughing and I'm like, dad, what's so funny? And he points out there's an article on how many spiders there are up here like a huge diversity of spiders. Is that, is that right? That's true. Up here? And then right below that is an ad for spider extermination services <laughs> by some local company up here on the island. So, and I thought the juxtaposition of those two was, was great. So we do need to think about, as we, I mean, we think spiders are great. We think, uh, we think all of these things are great. But we do need to be thinking about how do other people react to that and how do we design our strategies to take their reactions and their needs into account. So again, as you're thinking about proposals and other things that you're doing, I really encourage you to think about how does this research actually get applied on the ground? How are you guys actually going to use this 
uh, how are other people going to use this uh, in the real world? So the Nature Conservancy, uh, we are all about trying to protect uh, those lands and waters that all life needs to, uh, to survive. Um, these are a couple of our scientists here out in um, Big Darby Creek, uh, which is uh, one of the cleanest tributaries in, uh, in central Ohio and perhaps Ohio as well. Um, we're a leading organization and we're working around the world to, uh, to find those types of solutions where we bring different stakeholders together uh, for good conservation outcomes. And we're thinking about our work in terms of three broad strategies. We're thinking about actually protecting uh, lands and waters that sustain uh, all life on Earth. And uh, we, we do that in a variety of ways. I'm going to give you two examples as they re relate to uh, Lake Erie. We also are thinking about transforming the way that businesses and governments think about how they value uh, conservation and nature when they make their decisions, how it impacts their bottom line. And then finally, we all have to do more of this. We have to inspire people. We have to get people excited about nature. Um, you know, when you look at how much, and this is interesting for Friends of Stone Lab, when you look, there's a new publication out, Giving USA. When you look at where money goes, charitable donations go, give me a guess, what's number one? Health, a little bit further down, believe it or not. Education, college. Number two. Oh, yeah, sports or something. Actually, religion. Religion's number one. Education's number two. Guess who brings up the rear with 2%? We do. Yeah, we do. So think about it, though. What if, what if you could say to someone, this isn't about saving the Lake Erie water snake, and glad Kristen's not in the room, because I would get <laughs> tackled. Yeah, Liz, Liz back there. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So this, is, so this isn't about saving the Lake Erie water snake. What if you're talking about this is essential to making sure that Carroll Township doesn't have to shut down their water supply again? What if you're talking about it in terms of public health? What if you're talking about, and you're going in and you're meeting with a state legislator and saying, all right, uh, Senator Manning, your, your district's right along the lake. Um, do you know how much tourism it depends on? Uh, and if we don't address this issue, how much your district in particular stands to lose? Uh, so we need to figure out ways to inspire people, get them connected to our work, and figure out new ways to uh, engage them. And so one of the things we're working on, especially in Ohio, because we think water is so, such a critical part of Ohio, getting more public access to water and getting private landowners in particular more engaged. So I'll run through these really quickly because I know it's late and uh, you guys have been very attentive. Um, so here we have uh, Great Lakes Public Enemy number one. Uh, these are um, silver carp. They can jump. Big head carp can't. It just shows you how much I'm learning from Jeff. Um, so they uh, are devastating to the ecosystem because they uh, are filter feeders, of course, and they take all the plankton out that a lot of other fish uh, depend on. Um, and as adults, they can easily outcompete all of the other fish that, uh, that need uh, plankton to, uh, in their earlier stages of development. So one of the things that Nature Conservancy has been uh, working with on Notre Dame is trying to focus on early detention, uh, detection. By the way, I like, this, I like this photo. This reminds me of how many University of Michigan faculty does it take to take a sample. <laughs> um, so, so I'm contractually obligated by Jeff to make at least one University of Michigan joke during my presentation. Uh, so sorry, I, I, know, I know who you are. Uh, in, any, in any event, uh, actually that's John Stark, he's our director of freshwater, the guy who's kind of scowling and looking over the edge at the uh, DNR guy who's taking the sample here. Um, but what, what our scientists have been able to work on is a way to uh, take water samples and um, uh, Asian carp and, and other species, they leave uh, DNA, uh, they leave genetic markers in the water, right? They, uh, through waste products, through skin, through blood. Um, you will able, you're able to find um, uh, samples of this, and they're able to take them back to a lab, and they're able to test. Uh, this was a makeshift lab that was set up in Zanesville. That makes me think a little Breaking Bad here, what they're up to. But, uh, <laughs> but, they, uh, but they're able to go ahead and test uh, uh, to see uh, whether or not uh, there are any um, 
uh, add any evidence to any of these genetic markers in the water. And we were looking at the Muskingum watershed because the Muskingum watershed used to be part of the Ohio Erie Canal, at least the headwaters did. And uh, that was only in existence for less than 100 years as a way to transport uh, goods and services, uh, goods along the, uh, along the canal. Uh, but uh, it still is, uh, parts of it are still connected. And the concern is that they might provide a, uh, an access point for carp to get up uh, into Lake Erie. So we wanted to see how far um, carp had got up from the Ohio River. And what we found uh, was that uh, we did te testing in late October. And what we found was evidence of at least big head carp had moved pretty far upstream into the Muskingum watershed. Um, so that's, that's cause for quite a bit of alarm. Um, ground zero, though, for Asian carp is in uh, the Chicago area. And I think uh, some of you may know. Well, does anyone know what this is? Chicago ship. The sanitary ship canal. Correct. Yep. And this was constructed also and finished in 1900. I'm just, it's amazing what people were able to do at that point in time. Essentially, they had a problem in Chicago. Uh, they were fouling their drinking water uh, because uh, sewage was going down the Chicago River and, and from Indiana through the Calumet River into Lake Michigan, where they had their water intakes at those two uh, black dot areas. Um, so what they ended up doing, I'm going to point right here. What they ended up doing was re, uh, reversing the flow of the Chicago River by creating the uh, canal right in that area. Um, and, uh, and, and as a result, the lake level actually dropped. Water was able to then flow down, and basically Chicago sent its sewage to St. Louis to deal with. Um, and it uh, was able to take clean drinking water out of there. Well, the problem is now we have the Great Lakes and the uh, Mississippi River watershed are now connected. And uh, that has been a problematic pathway for a lot of invasive species. I think we all know that uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels, which uh, infiltrated the Great Lakes about 20, 25 years ago, are now pretty far, uh, farly established in the Mississippi River watershed. So that's a, uh, that's a huge issue for us as well. Um, one of the things that Nature Conservancy has been trying to do is bring a group of stakeholders around a table to talk about solutions. Um, and this is a pretty touchy subject because this is an important thoroughfare for barge traffic. There's a lot of, of goods that get shipped uh, from ships that come into the Great Lakes, transferred to barges, which then go down uh, the Mississippi River to other destinations. Um, they're on one side of the argument saying you can't close this because of everything that, uh, that, that uh, it depends on. And then you have folks on the other side that are saying, do you realize how devastating Asian carp will be to not only the ecology, but the economy of the Great Lakes if you let it up into the Great Lakes. There are some electronic barriers uh, that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers installed some time ago, but there's a couple problems with those. One, they're prone to failure at times. And number two, they only work one way. The water is flowing this way, so it didn't keep uh, Round Gobi out it didn't, of, the, uh, of the Mississippi River watershed. It didn't keep quagga or zebra mussels out. And now there's a new invader, Eurasian Rough, up in Lake Superior that uh, could easily, because of flowing down that way, even if it got zapped and stunned, it would still just float down. It would recover south of the electronic barrier and start to infiltrate the Mississippi River. So we need to figure out a solution which addresses not only the economic needs of the industries that depend on these, uh, these channels, but also the environmental imperative of addressing this as a conduit for invasive species between both of the basins. Um, we don't have a solution yet, but we've got groups together and we're talking. Uh, you have to be very careful about the language that you choose in these types of situations as well. People get very upset when you talk about a uh, hydrological barrier. They think of a big concrete piece just cutting off the uh, channel there and not allowing any uh, movement of goods, and we've been talking about an ecological barrier, which means that water could still be able to flow, but we need to figure out a way to treat that water as it goes through to prevent aquatic invasive species from going either way. It's important. Uh, it's a two-way two -way pathway. Wetlands, very important, obviously, in terms of um, a, uh, a habitat that we've lost in Ohio. Uh, 90 to 95 percent 
um, of our uh, naturally occurring wetlands have been converted, oftentimes for agricultural use, but also because of development. And uh, we're trying to bring some back. We're trying to get that, uh, stop that uh, loss and try to take it back the other way. This is a pretty cool project. Um, this, is, uh, this is where the engineer in me gets really excited. So this is a, uh, a piece of property that Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge owns it's called the Blousey Track. Uh, here's the Two Saint River right here. Uh, this, these are some farm fields. This is the uh, property that the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge owns. Here's a ditch. We were talking about ditches earlier. There's a little nice little 90 degree turn. Okay. And uh, it goes through these, uh, these farm fields right through here that probably have tiles set up which drain into this ditch, which go in here, which then when this little pond gets to a certain height, uh, exits through these two pipes right into the Two Saint River. So, we went about um, re-engineering this, and we sat down actually with Ducks Unlimited. They're very good at, uh, at developing uh, and bringing back wetlands. Um, and here's what we came up with. Uh, we ended up with a new uh, type of a, a new type of a, um, a flow regime where some of the water that's going through here and going straight into the Two Saint River would get redirected into uh, these farm fields, which again. We were trying to keep the water off of them. Now we're trying to put the water back onto them. And then there's an exit point here, a little, and there's actually a fish ladder and a water gate, which allows us to control the level of the water that's in these areas right here. And the results are pretty stunning. This is uh, during, and just take a look here. You see these trees in the background? Use those as a reference point. And this was taken about a year later. And there's the same trees in the background. Um, and we're already starting to see uh, egrets come back. Um, and Jeff, am I correct? Uh, I believe we're partnering with Sea Grant to monitor the quality of the water uh, and the differences in terms of the water that was going into I think the. Dr. Uh, Dr. Winslow is uh, working on that project. Okay, great. Yeah. We're monitoring the fish inside and outside of the wetlands. Uh, Dr. Chapman is doing some of the water. So this is an excellent example of a partnership that we have with you all. Uh, looking at um, uh, how this wetland is uh, is providing habitat not only for fish but also addressing water quality issues. Uh, a little bit about our work with uh, farmers. This is an example of those last two are example of how we're trying to protect these resources. This is an example of how we're trying to transform the way people are thinking about uh, practices on the ground. So farming, 4.5 million acres of farmland in uh, northwest Ohio. Uh, here's, an, oops, here's an example of a, uh, a ditch uh, that's not very well maintained. You can see the, uh, the effects of uh, water in terms of scouring it, <coughs> sediment uh, erosion being a big problem, and of course nutrients being carried downstream. Um, so what we uh, ended up doing was creating a partnership with a lot of agribusinesses. Think about the supply chain for uh, commodity products like corn. Got a whole bunch of farmers in this one area. You've got a whole bunch of people that are using the product at the other end. Okay. How do you go ahead and influence change as uh, through the supply chain? Well, right in the middle here is a group of companies called agribusinesses. These are the folks that a lot of farmers pay to come and do soil samples uh, to to give them advice on how much fertilizer they need to spread. And these are often the same businesses that are then paid to go ahead and apply that fertilizer on behalf of the farmers. Well, we and some other folks thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we could actually work with those folks right in the middle of the supply chain? There's actually a pretty limited number of those companies out there. A few big ones that have most of the business and then a lot of smaller ones. What if we could work with that small handful of, they're called nutrient service providers, to uh, change the way that they apply fertilizer so that um, you're applying the right amount at the right time, at the right rate, and at the right place. Um, and so we ended up creating this 4R nutrient certification uh, program. Um, and we invited uh, these nutrient service suppliers, these agribusinesses, to become involved with it. Uh, and we said, look, this is a great opportunity for you guys on a voluntary basis to change the way that you're doing business. Uh, some of the standards are very common sense. You know, don't spread your fertilizer on a, on a field that's frozen because when it thaws, a lot of that fertilizer is just going to wash off. Don't spread it 12 to 24 hours before a major storm event is predicted. They're very common sense types of, of, of rules, and there's a lot, it's a lot more complicated than that, the only parts that I'm able to retain. 
But so this certification program, though, is something that these agribusinesses can show farmers to say, we're part of this and we'll help you as the agricultural community look a lot better and help your, with your license to operate uh, in, in, uh, in Northwest Ohio. Um, we're actually going to do some um, monitoring of the results. Uh, but so far, we've had a really good uh, response rate. We have had 51 agribusinesses sign up so far. Each of those agribusinesses represent about 50,000 acres. So we're at about 2.5 million of that 4.5 million uh, that's going to be covered so far. And, and hopefully, we'll, we'll participate in this program going forward. But like I said, uh, we, have, um, we actually just got a grant to do some research to monitor how much of an impact uh, this, uh, this um, that this uh, new, uh, these new business practices will have in terms of nutrient levels. All right, I'm going to finish up here really quickly with just the inspire part, which is really the fun part. We have a new uh, nature preserve out on Catawba Island called Great Egret Marsh. Uh, for those of you uh, who are familiar with East Harbor State Park, it is literally across the street from it. It was the only undeveloped piece of property left there. A uh, family by the name of MacEndeavor owned it. They owned, they developed a lot of the land north of this piece of property, a lot of small lots with trailers and boats and whatnot. Um, and the daughter of the, uh, the father who did a lot of developing said, you know, I'd really like to see this piece of property preserved. So they sold it to us for a bargain sale. And we thought, you know, a lot of our nature preserves are often uh, put in place because we're trying to protect a certain piece of biodiversity. This time we actually decided we're going to buy this preserve because it is centrally located and it will give the public access to some really neat amenities in this area. So we put some trails in here, a lot of interpretive signage, and we've also got a uh, canoe launch here as well. I do love this particular photo because it's called Great Egret Marsh, and you'll notice there are no great egrets anywhere to be seen. So we should have photoshopped a little into, into that photo right there. So, but we do have a canoe launch. We've got overlooks and, and a uh, loop trail as well. Finally, we have a, another program in Northwest Ohio um, around the Oak Openings region called our Green Ribbon Initiative. Um, and this is actually where we sign contracts with private landowners to go onto their property to help them manage for native species. Um, we also do um, all sorts of different types of um, presentations. This is one on how to build your own butterfly garden um, to help folks in the local community figure out how to plant more habitat um, that's, that's uh, native, uh, because we can only do so much. Land's expensive, especially up in Northwest Ohio because you're competing with productive farm land. So there's only so much land that we're going to be able to buy, uh, but if we can have an impact with private landowners, we can have a tremendous, uh, we can actually expand the uh, scope and scale of our conservation work through, uh, through private landowners. So here are my concluding thoughts. Um, it's really important as we go forward to think about how can we mainstream conservation into everyday decisions by businesses, governments, and communities. And again, let's just not talk about environment because of specific species, but let's talk about it in terms, in broader terms that people can understand. Let's talk about it in terms of public health. Let's talk about it in terms of recreation enjoyment. Uh, you've probably heard of the book Last Child in the Woods, Richard Liu wrote about uh, nature deficit disorder. What happens to kids when they're raised and they don't have exposure to nature? They have attention deficit issues. Uh, they've got behavior and developmental issues. Let's talk about and make those connections to the things that we're all doing here. Because at the end of the day, everyone's ultimate goal, whether you're an environmentalist or you're a business leader, is to help your natural world, which supports a more prosperous human population. And by that, I want to be very cautious and say, I'm not saying let's use nature, let's squeeze everything we can get out of it um, and, and, uh, and try to con uh, convert it basically to one purpose or another. Because what we've seen in places like Northwest Ohio when we did that with all the ditches for agricultural productivity is that there are a lot of unintended consequences. We really need to find that balance between the needs of people and nature. And again, that's something that I think the Nature Conservancy does very well. So a little bit of uh, beach reading for you all once you're done with your five weeks here. Uh, just some recommendations. Now, anyone read this book, 1493? It's a great book about the Columbian Exchange, basically starting with uh, Christopher Columbus coming over, and uh, shortly after that, a lot of the um, uh, incursions from uh, Europe brought with them a lot of species, plant and animal species. 
it talks about how starting in about you know, 1493 after Columbus uh, came to the New World, a lot of those interactions, uh, you see a lot of spread of foods uh, being imported in different areas, horses, honeybees coming over into North America that weren't here native, uh, that weren't native originally, and what impact that had. Um, it's just a reminder to us that sometimes we think of nature as being very pristine uh, and that we found it that way, and the reality is um, there have been changes to nature for, for centuries. Win-win um, ecology, uh, this is a little bit of a harder book to find, but this guy, Michael Rosenzweig, wrote a book about what he calls recre uh, reconciliation ecology, and he encouraged us to think not just about protected areas like preserves, but to think about nature all around us. Think about nature in your backyard. Think about green roofs. Uh, think about the nature that, the, you know, the, uh, the part of the power plant that they can't develop because they need a buffer area around that. What kind of habitat does that provide? So he really encouraged us to think more holistically about uh, people and nature and to not think about civilization as being something that's over here and nature as something over here. He's really thinking about that's really, it really blends a lot. And we need to think about uh, strategizing that way. And I will give a shameless plug for my CEO's book, Nature's Fortune. Uh, which is a brilliant book, and uh, it's talking about uh, how, um, how investing in nature is one of the best uh, investments that businesses can make. So this is really more geared toward a business audience, and our CEO came from Goldman Sachs, the Nature Conservancy. He is a committed environmentalist, but he wants to make sure that we are having an impact far beyond uh, you know, preaching to the choir. And uh, so he gives some great examples about how, for example, we're looking and working with Dow uh, Chemical, uh, their plant in Freeport, Texas, they have a lot of problems because they're losing some of the coastal marshes in the area because of storm surges. And so one of the answers is, well, we can build a seawall. Well, you could build a seawall, but that's a depreciation, depreciating asset. What if you built, built a uh, oyster reef instead in that area? Uh, not only does it cost about the same amount as a seawall, but it's actually an appreciating asset with a lot of compounding benefits because now you've created habitat, you've made the fishermen very happy, uh, and you still get the benefit that you wanted in the first place, which was uh, storm attenuation. So he's talking about how can nature be used uh, in, in many, different uh, many different situations uh, to actually sometimes be a better long-term solution than, say, a man-made solution. And that's it. Thank you again, Stone Lab, for having me up here. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Uh, questions for Josh? Josh, I got a quick one for you. Uh, a lot of times people would think about Nature Conservancy and just think about your preservation ef efforts. Uh, and you don't have to go back too far, and it seems like that's about all that you're, you're, you were doing. But you're, you're spending more time now, or at least as much time as, as it would seem on policy issues. you want to talk a, at all about that transition and why and sort of how that occurred? Sure. Well, so, uh, the, so you mentioned the Clean Ohio Fund work that we did. So the Clean Ohio Fund makes money available for green space, for farmland preservation, and multi-use trails. It used to also make money available for a brownfield to clean up. Um, and being able to put time into working with the General Assembly and the Governor's Office to get $100 million put into the last capital bill for uh, green space means that not just the Nature Conservancy, but land trusts and metro parks and local municipal governments across the state can now have, an, now have a source of funding if they want to protect a certain area. Um, there's only so much work that we have the ability to do. We just don't have enough staff or capacity or time to go out and protect all these, air, these places. So if we're able to work through policy and make funding available that a lot of other people can then come to, and a metro park can come and conserve a piece of property, or the Trust for Public Land can come and conserve a piece of property, um, we're able to actually have a much bigger impact than if the Nature Conservancy tried to go out to a group of donors and say, okay, we've got to raise this much money for the Vinton Furnace Project, and this much money for the Sunshine Corridor, and this much money for Great Egret Marsh. Um, we actually use Clean Ohio uh, to help us uh, pay for uh, Great Egret Marsh. Um, so working through policy uh, in those respects uh, and creating, I guess, kind of an enabling framework that makes conservation a lot easier is a much better strategy for us because 
then it's not just about us, it's about the whole community. So um, taking productive land and either restoring it or doing something else with it is obviously expensive and at least in Northwest Ohio I know a few, a couple of larger tracks, but most of them are small like the, the two same one and I manage a nature preserve that's 250 acres, like those sizes. Is there any money, hope, thoughts? Putting people together to, to get larger areas restored. So we did actually do a um, a mapping exercise where we looked at the Western Lake Erie Basin, and we identified parcels using a number of criteria. We wanted to see um, parcels where you saw a lot of migratory birds. We wanted to see parcels where it was either already a wetland or you could restore it to a wetland, and we wanted to see parcels that were at least 50 acres or larger. And then we looked for connectivity or corridors among those different types of acres. Um, and we found that um, there are some kind of blobs out there that we could work on. But it's a very expensive proposition. Yeah. I mean, you have to get a lot of partners together. One of the exciting things, though, is that um, we've started to develop some really good relationships with the uh, hook and bullet crowd and the hunt clubs. And there are a lot of hunt clubs up here uh, in this area. And so we've been doing a lot of work with Linus Point and doing restoration on their land. Um, but there are a lot of folks that are looking for private property as well. If they're interested in buying a piece of property, restoring it to wetland because it's better to hunt, but they'd be willing to put an easement on it, that means that it won't be developed, then they can just be used for, as a hunting area. Um, th those are those partnerships we can use as well. So there's some different approaches. I will say, though, that the wetland situation, we did the Blousey Tract project more as a demonstration project, and we've got a few other projects we're going to do. I don't think we can get to the water quality levels we need just through wetland restoration. We're going to have to work on basically the, uh, the input side, the, the nutrient certification side that I mentioned, and get less fertilizer uh, running off into the streams. Thanks, great. Josh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next week, uh, Two very good talks. Uh, the first, the research talk is really going to build on what Josh talked about today when he was talking.